At the death of Pope Nicholas V in the middle of the 15th century, the Orsini and Colonna cardinals came to a deadlock in their struggle for the papacy, and a neutral and innocuous alternative was sought in Alfonso Borgia, a Spanish canonist of some scholarly distinction. Calixtus III, as he named himself, was a gouty valetudinarian who lay abed most of the day in pious conversation with friars. He very properly disdained the new art and culture and saved the papal funds to meet the advancing Turks. He had, however, one weakness which was destined to prove very costly to the papacy. There was a tradition of nepotism at Rome, and Calixtus had nephews. While he was Bishop of Valencia, his sister Isabella had come to him from Sativa, their native place, with her two sons Pedro Luis and Rodrigo. When, in 1455, he became Pope, he sent Rodrigo to study at Bologna and enriched him with benefices. Rodrigo Borgia was in his 25th or 26th year, an exceptionally handsome young Spaniard with the most charming Spanish manners and with rich, sensuous lips and an eye for maidens which escaped his uncle's notice. He and his cousin were within a year made cardinals. In December 1456, he was appointed legate for the March of Ancona, and in the following May, he was, in spite of the murmurs of the cardinals, promoted to the highest and most lucrative office at the court, the vice-chancellorship. His elder brother became Duke of Spoleto, gonfalonier of the papal army, and in 1457, prefect of Rome. In 1458, however, Calixtus fell ill and was reported to be dead, and the Romans chased the Catalans out of the city. Rodrigo at first retired with his more hated brother, but he courageously returned on August 6th, just in time to witness the actual death of his uncle. Aeneas Silvius mounted the throne under the name of Pius II, but the humanists looked in vain for favor to that genial diplomatist. He had reached a gouty and repentant age, and his one preoccupation was to stir a lethargic Christendom to a crusade against the Turks. Cardinal Rodrigo had been useful to him, reserving a vacant benefice for him now and again, so he kept his place and continued to win for himself wealthy bishoprics and abbeys. For a moment in 1460, Rodrigo trembled. Pius had sent him to direct the building of a cathedral at Siena, and the Pope startled his vice-chancellor with a stern letter. Rodrigo and another cardinal, the Pope heard, had entertained a number of very frivolous young ladies for five hours in a private garden. They had excluded the parents of these girls, and there had been dances of the most licentious character and other things which modesty forbids to recount. Beloved son, when four days ago, in the gardens of Giovanni de Bicis, were assembled several women of Siena addicted to worldly vanity, your worthiness, as we have learnt, little remembering the office which you fill, was entertained by them from the 17th to the 22nd hour. For companion you had one of your colleagues, one whom his years, if not the honour of the Holy See, should have reminded of his duty. From what we have heard, dancing was unrestrainedly indulged, and not one of love's attractions was absent, whilst your behaviour was no different from that which might have been looked for in any worldly youth. Our displeasure is unutterable, since all this reflects dishonourably upon the sacerdotal estate and office. It will be said of us that we are enriched and promoted not to the end that we may lead blameless lives, but that we may procure the means to indulge our pleasures. Hence the contempt of us entertained by temporal princes and powers, and the daily sarcasms of the laity. Hence also the reproof of our own mode of life when we attempt to reprove others. The very Vicar of Christ is involved in this contempt, since he appears to countenance such things. You, beloved son, have charge of the bishopric of Valencia, the first of Spain, you are also Vice-Chancellor of the Church, and what renders your conduct still more blameworthy is that you are among the Cardinals, with the Pope, one of the Councillors of the Holy See. We are censured on your account. The blessed memory of your uncle Calixtus is vituperated, since in the judgment of many he was wrong to have conferred so many honours upon you. Should similar facts recur, we shall be compelled to signify that they have happened against our will and to our sorrow, and our censure must be attended by your shame. We have always loved you, and we have held you worthy of our favour as a man of upright and honest nature. Act therefore in such a manner that we may maintain such an opinion of you, and nothing can better conduce to this than that you should lead a well-ordered life." Rodrigo urged that there had been exaggeration, but the Pope, while admitting the possibility of this, again sternly bade him mind his behaviour. 
The long discussion of the morals of Alexander VI has in fact now ended in entire agreement that by the year 1460 at least, he was openly immoral. The papal and other documents relating to his children, at least six in number, which have been found in the Vatican archives and in the private archives of the Duke of Asuna, show an extraordinary laxity at Rome. At least four of these children were born of Vanozza de Catane, a Roman lady who was the cardinal's mistress from about 1460 to 1486. Nothing is confidently known about her early years, but her epitaph has been discovered, and it honours her, not only for her signal probity and great piety, but because she was the mother of Cesar, Juan, Hofre, and Lucrezia Borgia. In 1471, a pious and learned Franciscan friar, Sixtus IV, assumed the tiara, and it is an indication of the strange temper of the times that under such a man, the papal court became more corrupt than ever. Sixtus vigorously restored the secular rule of the papacy and encouraged the artistic and cultural development, but his nepotism was shameless and profoundly harmful. One of the nephews, whom he drew from the obscurity of a Franciscan monastery and made a prince of the church was Pietro Riario, who spent 260,000 ducats and within two years of his promotion wore out his life in the most flagrant dissipation. His immense palace with its magnificent treasures, its 500 servants in scarlet silk and its prodigious banquets was the home of every species of vice. And it is said that his chief mistress, Tiresia, flaunted 800 ducats worth of pearls on her embroidered slippers. Another nephew was the sterner, though also immoral Cardinal Giuliano della Rovere, also brought from a monastery, whom is known today as Julius II. When Sixtus died in 1484, Rodrigo made a resolute effort to get the tiara. The dispatches of the ambassadors who now represented the northern states at the Vatican afford us a valuable means of checking the chroniclers, and they put it beyond question that Borgia and Giuliano della Rovere entered upon a corrupt rivalry for the papacy. Giuliano was now a tall, serious-looking man of forty, reserved in speech and brusque in manners, a good soldier and most ambitious courtier. Although he was known to have children, he kept a comparatively sober household and reserved his wealth for special occasions of display and for bribery. Borgia was his senior by thirteen years, but he had the buoyancy, gaiety and sensuality of a young man. He too kept a moderate table and gambled little, but his amours were notorious, and one could not please him better than by providing a ballet of handsome women. In the conclave it was soon apparent that neither Rodrigo nor Giuliano could command the necessary two-thirds of the votes, and they agreed to adopt Cardinal Cibo, a Genoese noble who had outburned the passions of youth before he entered the service of the church. During the night of August 28th, when the supporters of Cardinal Barbo, who seemed to be sure of election, had confidently retired to their cells, Rodrigo and Giuliano, by intrigue and bribery, secured a majority for Cibo. He became Innocent VIII, and during the eight years of his amiable and futile pontificate, the College of Cardinals steadily sank. Innocent's natural son was drawn from his decent obscurity and made one of the richest nobles of Rome, and women were hardly safe even in their own homes when Franceschetto Cibo roamed the streets at night with his cutthroats in one of his wine-flushed moods. He took so ardently to the new pastime of gambling that in one night he lost 100,000 ducats to Cardinal Riario. Cardinal Ascanio Sforza, brother of the ruler of Milan, was the leading sportsman of Roman society. The state of Rome was in accord with the state of the sacred college. We may hesitate to believe in Fasura when he tells us that if criminals were by some chance arrested, they bought their liberty at the Vatican. But we have in Burchard's diary a somber incidental indication of the condition of Rome. When Rodrigo's son, Juan, was murdered, a boatman said, when they asked why he had not reported seeing a body cast into the river, that it was not customary to have any inquiry made into a nightly occurrence of that kind. Rodrigo Borgia, the vice-chancellor, paid no heed to this condition of the city. He added year by year to the long list of his bishoprics and emoluments and prepared to renew the struggle for the tiara. He lost or discarded Vanozza when she married her third husband in 1486 
and entered upon a more sordid and equally notorious liaison. His cousin, Adriana Orsini, had charge of a young orphan, Giulia Farnese, a very beautiful, golden-haired girl. She married Adriana's son, Orso Orsini, in 1489, her 15th year, and at the same time became the cardinal's mistress. Adriana was rewarded with a considerable influence and the charge of the young Lucrezia Borgia. The death of Innocent on July the 25th, 1492, led to fierce intrigue and passionate encounters. There were more than 200 murders in Rome during the 14 days before the conclave, for which 22 cardinals were, on August 6th, immured in the Sistine Chapel. Giuliano della Rovere had spoiled his prospect by too patent a use of his influence on Innocent VIII, and Borgia set himself to win the next most important rival, Ascanio Sforza. Historians sometimes smile at the statement of Infesura that four mule loads of silver passed from Borgia's palace to that of Sforza, but it is not improbable. For some centuries there had been a custom, abolished a few years later by Leo X, of sacking the palace of the cardinal who was elected pope, and it was not unusual to take precautions. Borgia may have sent the silver on this pretext, as Infesura suggests, and he would hardly expect it to be returned. It is, in fact, now certain that Sforza was bribed with gifts far more valuable than Borgia's table silver. Borgia offered, and afterwards gave him his splendid palace, the vice-chancellorship, the bishopric of Erlen, worth 10,000 ducats a year, and other appointments. The sober Cardinal Colonna accepted the Abbey of Subiaco, or 2,000 ducats a year. Eleven cardinals seem to have sold their votes, and Borgia already had three supporters and his own vote. He secured his majority and hastily retired behind the altar, where papal vestments of three sizes were laid out, and the genial Romans presently roared their greetings to Alexander VI. Rome and Italy then sustained their parts in the comedy. Alexander, although now 60 years old, was a vigorous and capable man and some advantage would be expected from his pontificate. After the coronation at St. Peter's on August 27th, Alexander received on the steps of the great church the greetings of the orators who represented the northern cities. One wonders what was the countenance of the massed prelates and nobles when the Genoese orator read, Thou art so adorned with the glory of virtue, the merit of discipline, the holiness of thy life, that we must hesitate to say whether it is more proper to offer thee to the pontificate or to offer that most sacred and glorious dignity to thee. And, as Alexander passed in stately procession to the Lateran, he read on the triumphal arches which adorned the route such maxims as chastity and charity. And great was Rome under Caesar, now is she most great. Alexander VI reigns, Caesar was a man, this is a god. He sustained the scandal of his personal conduct until the end of his life. During the first four years of his pontificate, the youthful Giulia Orsini was his chief favorite, and she was known to the wits of Rome as the spouse of Christ. She and Adriana Orsini and Girolama, the Pope's elder daughter, are described as the heart and eyes of Alexander and suitors had to seek their favor. When Julia's brother received the red hat, Rome gave the future Pope, who was by no means without personal merit, the name of the Petticoat Cardinal. One night in the unhealthy heat of August 1501, Alexander and Caesar sat late at supper with Cardinal Adriano da Corneto. Romance has it that the poisoned wine they intended for their host was served to them. Modern history is content with the known malaria of an autumn night. On August 18th, Alexander died. There are few good deeds to be put in the scale against the crimes and vices of Alexander VI. He was a selfish voluptuary of the most ignoble type. He countenanced and employed fraud, treachery and crime, and the condition in which he left the papacy had not the redeeming merit of effecting the security of the institution over which he ignominiously presided.